Very good morning to everyone. Welcome to this session on Asian Innovation Clusters at the Horasis uh, Asia meeting. We are very delighted. We have four speakers who are here uh, with us, but one is yet to come in. So we'll start with three first. I'm very delighted that we have here uh, Mr. Tian Chiu, Managing Director of Paul Ventures from Hong Kong and who used to live in Australia and Melbourne before. Uh, we have some common friends in uh, Australia. And then we have all the way from Moscow, Mr. Maxim Kiselev, the CEO of the Human Capital Development Foundation of the government of Moscow, Russia. And finally, we have Mr. Strika Reddy, CEO of Sonata Software in Bangalore, India. But today, Strika is in New York enjoying the autumn of New York, the lovely uh, autumn flowers that I always love to see as well. So today we have this session uh, on Asian Innovation Clusters. We have 45 minutes for our session. I was just suggesting to each of the speakers that perhaps you could use six to seven minutes to make your introductory presentation, and then we'll go on to question and answers uh, right away after that. So let me just start by saying that innovation clusters are very essential to spearhead transformation of countries, particularly in the area of digital transformation. But the world that has gone upside down over the last two years has seen so many people requiring to work from home. So the question now arises is, whether clusters are still effective or apt or relevant, or, or we should be thinking of new ways to promote innovation from home. How can we get innovation? How do we get teams to work together on innovation? Yet at the same time, there is a lot of uh, proposals and, and, and discussions on the need to move further ahead from just innovation clusters to what people are now saying super innovation clusters. Innovation in super clusters. Innovation super clusters. That, that whole concept of, of innovation super clusters needs to perhaps be addressed uh, during the course of uh, today as well. So we have Dinesh joining us. Good morning, Walam. Hey, good morning. How are you doing? Uh, four of you here today. We have, of course, one other speaker who fell ill today is unable to, uh, to join us, but I think with the four of us, we should be able to have a good uh, conversation. So uh, I think that's all I'd like to say as an introduction. May I just go on to the first speaker? I would follow the order that the program has put. So the first speaker now would be uh, our friend from Russia, Mr. Maxim Kiselev. Perhaps you can share with us your thoughts on, on how innovation is driven in, in Russia these days. Over to you. Yeah. Good morning. In another time, I'm happy to be uh, with uh, with us this morning. Uh, and uh, you know, like for me, harassis is something which is very, uh, very dear. I would say because I have been taking part in the harassis meetings ever since they started. Like 2012 was the first one when I was representing this the Skolkova Foundation. And if you know, this is the major innovation center in Russia that was, as a matter of fact, founded by the by the federal government in order to uh, support and to promote innovation uh, in the country and to bridge, you know, the uh, the huge number of labs around the country with the idea of commercializing research and development so that was that was an attempt to actually um, bring out from the lab something that could turn could be turned into the new technologies innovative technologies and innovative products for the people now the covid as a matter of fact was a very massive i would say um hit uh on some of the aspects of innovation clusters in Russia, considering that not all of the innovations can be done online. Well, while we're talking about the information technologies and communication technologies, yes, they did not suffer much, and 
some of the things uh, on the contrary. They, as a matter of fact, they uh, experience tremendous growth, especially considering that for the IT companies, well, uh, working online on the on the one hand was kind of uh, natural. On on the other hand, they saved. Uh, very considerable funds on, uh, I would say, like uh, not being in need to rent the offices. And so uh, after the first wave of the COVID, when literally the companies could get back to the offices, they just didn't. They These information technologies companies, they continued to be online. For them, that was very feasible. As uh, for uh, the aspects, uh, well, let me take the bright side of the moon and say like what we managed to do in order to keep up with everything. Well, as the professor of, of Skoltech, and if you know Skoltech, the Skolko Institute of Science and Technology is the creation of MIT. And uh, this is the, the one and the only model of technological entrepreneurial university in Russia. Uh, but, uh, and this is an integrated part of the Skolkova Innovation Center. But for 18 months, until the beginning of September of this year, we had to work online only because the campus was closed. It was totally closed. And to tell you the truth, uh, it was not easy because, uh, you know, like as I said, like lots and lots, uh, on the one hand, lots and lots of the things, they need the labs. But there was no access, no no physical access to the labs. So one challenge was to provide where it was possible some sort of online access to the lab works, well, with the representatives who could, get access and who could be there and then turning online something what was done previously by many inside the lab. But uh, I'm a professor of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and one of the leading courses as well as obligatory course for our master's students is called the Innovation Workshop. We actually adopted that from MIT directly. And this that that course could not be done online. So uh, we were very happy when we managed to get back to campus in September. Uh, why it could not be done online? Because this is like intensive 24-7 uh, boot camp. And at the end of it, well, the students come out with the project, the meaningful project in innovation. So uh, we were suffering a lot without being able to do that. However, well, this, this September we got back to campus. And, and right now, well, uh, the situation is uh, more or less admitting to stay in, in, in campus, in campus. Well, sorry for, for the long talk. What I'm saying is I will summarize. Well, the clusters themselves, they did not suffer, I believe, because uh, they try to continue, well, if we take, let's say, the Skolkova as, as the biggest, so to say, cluster in innovations in the country, if we take uh, some very big IT uh, cluster in Kazan, in Russia, well, uh, they did not suffer too much, but still uh, it was very challenging and very hard to keep up with many of the things. Though we tried it, I, I believe that we survived somehow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Maxim, for your uh, brief introductory remarks. I, I know it's challenging running innovation with our labs, particularly if you are in the biotechnology area. Do you see next year returning to normal and things would be back on track? And, and what do you think will be the two or three most important priorities that you will want to focus on when you get back to normal operations? 
I I want to believe that it would get back to normal, uh, though, you know, with these modifications of the virus, well, nobody knows, so, so to say, because we did not expect really this very hard uh, third wave in the row now, uh, as well as the European countries, I believe they did not expect it either. But uh, what I can say that we are now uh, really much more prepared than we were before. And uh, I believe that operations will stay, so to say, like normal in terms of the access to the physical uh, facilities, to the labs, to pretty much everything. One of the things that stays very difficult for us, we're an international university. And quite a number of international students uh, from some of the countries that are totally locked, well, they couldn't come. They could not come. They just could not enter Russia at this period of time. Hopefully it will change. Uh, well, and I do hope that next year, well, they would be able to come. But, but at this point, they are online in the places where they are locked in. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Tianjiu. Maybe you can share with us what are the issues, challenges that you are facing in Hong Kong. Share also your experience back in Australia because you had two country experiences. Yeah, th thanks, Michael, and, and thanks uh, for, for, for having me on the, uh, on, on the session. So, yeah, I'll actually take those two aspects into, into maybe some things I'll share today. Um, a little bit of background about Polar Ventures. Um, we basically focus on small, medium-sized enterprises that are essentially in a transformative stage. And we either do absolutely uh, nothing at all, hands off, or we can actually become totally immersive. And uh, I might walk through some of my experiences um, right now because I'm actually our CEO of a biotech company that's focused on cancer and infectious diseases that's actually listed and based out of Australia while I'm living in Hong Kong. So, um, so a few things come out of that. Um, one of them is um, certainly in Hong Kong, um, the cluster here is uh, – on innovation, particularly around science technology. Uh, there is a Hong Kong Science Park, and Hong Kong strategically is uh, positioned as part of the Greater Bay Area linking up to China. And, and I think that's going to be one of those ecosystems that will be quite quite important for uh, particularly for healthcare um, going forward. Now, in terms of Melbourne, um, the innovation clusters that I deal with there um, through my role in, uh, at, at Invion is uh, essentially working with our institutes such as um, the Hudson Institute of Medical Research, which has you know, uh, nearly 500 scientists uh, um, focused on a number of different disease areas. Um, we're also working with the Peter McCallum Cancer Center, uh, which is one of Australia's, oh, actually one of the world's best um, uh, translational medicine areas, 100% focused on cancer. Uh, they have, they're literally running 500 clinical trials in cancer right now. And so, you know, the, the, the question is, um, how, how is uh, the world we live in sort of changed, um, um, you know, how innovation is created? Um, one aspect is actually our experience um, at, at Invion. Uh, we were actually going to go to clinical trials last year. And uh, it's a bit hard to do a trial when you can't get to a clinic and you actually can't get people there. So that, that makes it a little bit more challenging. So that actually spurred an opportunity to create innovation for us because we actually put a pause in that program. We took a step back, went back into discovery phase to improve the underlying active pharmaceutical ingredient. And it ended up that uh, after uh, uh, coming out the other end, we actually had something which was um, 50 times uh, more potent than the previous version that we were looking at and still had very good um, um, therapeutic profile. So, so, so in that sense, that creates a, a fortuitous um, uh, uh, opportunity. However, I think from a more taking a step back, um, the experiences I've had in terms of clusters um, face to face versus uh, uh, really the the, um, the Zoom calls like we have now is uh, really from a from a very tactical perspective. Um, I actually found it to be very, very efficient. I've been running a company out of Australia from Hong Kong for the past two years. And in terms of execution, tactical, operational, getting to meetings, getting things done, it's actually far more efficient. Um, it's, it, you don't have to 
go to a meeting, come back, um, you've got an agenda, you get things done, and you can have basically literally three times as many meetings um, uh, to cover um, issues. Um, I speak to Peter Mack, Hudson, speak to scientists, um, whether they're biologists, chemists, um, uh, even uh, uh, mathematical physicists, um, light experts, and, and it works extremely well when you get to the point. Now, the challenges that we have now is really around um, new relationships and more strategic discussions. They're much more difficult to have when you're just, just kind of on a Zoom call. Um, so, so, for example, we're starting to, uh, we're going to be doing um, at least, uh, initiating at least two clinical trials next year and um, in more than one cancer indications. So, so, so what that means is that I have to have multiple discussions with clinicians, uh, with researchers, and you can't just have a call and get to the answer. You kind of need to have that broader um, perspective. You've got to sort of um, go back and forth. And you may not be able to have as the, the innovation may come out of a less structured um, um, discussions um, as part of brainstorming. And so that that's created a uh, that's going to you know really need a, a more um, um, cluster based face to face um, based sort of discussion. And so I guess in conclusion, you know, my, my perspective on, on the question is really that I think it's going to be a hybrid model um, going forward. I think there's still a need to have face-to-face, -face, I think there's a real need to continue um, cluster uh, 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 clusters, physical interaction. Uh, but I also think that um, the tools we've been forced to use will make us more efficient and hopefully give us an ability to connect with the rest of the world um, in, in a time when we really need to connect. Um, everyone seems to be more insular these days. Uh, so, so, so I think it's going to be a, a, a good thing for us to, to continue these, uh, these remote discussions as well. Anyway, that's uh, my, my, uh, my thoughts on the topic. I might pass back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Tenjo. As you know, the owners of your company, Ron Lim and Michael Chu, are all friends of mine, so I'm very familiar with what you have been doing. My, my question is, how does this lockdown over these last two years have affected your fundraising and your clinical trust, which are critical to your success going forward? Yeah, well, the clinical trials um, were uh, paused, as, as I mentioned um, last year, um, but we, we announced uh, at our AGM that we're going to uh, resume and resume with, uh, uh, with, with uh, much more vigor and with also um, a lot more um, uh, potential because we actually have a better drug. In terms of the fundraising side, I mean, we are a public company. Um, there has been interest in, uh, in healthcare. We actually literally just closed a, a round of financing uh, last Friday. So, uh, so from that side, it, it really isn't a, uh, as much of an issue. Um, uh, easier for a public company. Um, from a private company, it, it's a little bit harder because a lot of private investors, having been on the other side, um, like sort of the, uh, I guess, something that's a little bit less tangible. They want to look someone in the eye. They kind of want to see what that person's like. They want to sort of poke around the edges. Um, that's a little bit harder to do on paper and through a computer. Uh, but that said, I think um, I think people have been forced to do it, and I think it also people have been forced to look at things uh, that are important. Um, I think previously uh, investors and companies focused on didn't focus on the eighty twenty, um, and, and now because of where we're at, we're kind of forced a lot more to look at what's important, what's not. Thank you, thank you. Wish you all the best in your future, and and hope that your your discoveries on cancer treatment can be a game changer and benefit mankind all over the world. Thanks, so Michael. May I, yeah. may I now invite our next speaker? I don't see him anymore here. Is, is Dinesh, are you still around? No, I think he's gone. Yeah, I saw him earlier, but he is no longer here. Hopefully, he'll join us back again. Um, may I now invite uh, Strika Reddy to share your thoughts with us? Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, yeah, glad to be here today and uh, listening to both uh, Maxim and uh, Thian on, uh, I think, their experiences over the last two years uh, of working through the post-pandemic era in terms of trying to figure out how one could continue with the 
overall culture of uh, innovation and uh, the various, I guess, challenges uh, faced uh, of working remotely and the need for collaborating in person uh, and also the, uh, the level of, I guess, success in actually uh, doing a lot more things more efficiently. And uh, I, I tend to agree a, a lot with uh, what, what we have said, uh, what they both have said. Uh, yeah, so my, our business, uh, Sonata Software, the global uh, tax services company. And uh, as somebody famously said at the beginning of the pandemic, I think there's been more digital transformation in the first six months of the pandemic than what has happened in the last 10 years. So... I think what the pandemic has has done is really driven a huge amount of uh, push in, into enterprises uh, wanting to uh, automate more. In, you know, I mean, and I, I would call automation uh, a level of innovation where they're looking at better customer experience, faster efficiencies in supply chains. I think the world supply chains got disrupted, and people were trying to find solutions to those through information technology uh, solutions about finding new new sources and ensuring the the bottlenecks in the supply chains uh, got uh, got reduced uh, how did you do, do contactless business i mean how can you do a lot of stuff through without contact whether you're a retailer manufacturer a fintech company a lot of obviously for a lot of businesses i think which were very digital in nature I think uh, the, uh, the 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 last two years actually helped them help them more innovate more be a lot more successful. But what it has also made is those companies who didn't invest in these technologies before the before the pandemic, they, it made their eyes open as they saw their competitors uh, being a lot more successful in the same business. Uh, 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 you know, I mean, and there are lots of examples across the world in terms of. Two companies in the same same industry, same business, doing the same thing, and one company was been extremely successful because uh, they had the foresight uh, in investing uh, in these uh, digital technologies. So to so to come back to my point, I think what it has done in our industry is it has forced enterprises to uh, do a lot more uh, innovation by applying digital technologies. Uh, obviously, it had forced us to. I know we had to move. 5,000 people to work from home in one day, actually. I mean, you know, and uh, nobody had ever thought that. If somebody had asked me that, is that possible? A year ago, I would have said absolutely not. Uh, and and that the fact that it has happened actually shows how innovative we can be when we are all pushed to a corner. Uh, that nobody complained that, you know, you know, I mean, I was yesterday working from the office and today working from home, the same project. The same deliverables, the same quality, the same issues of security, timeliness, everything. Nothing has changed. I mean, you know, and then I, and then I became a firm believer in human ingenuity, saying that, you know, when we get pushed, I think, you know, we are all capable of doing a lot more, a lot more stuff. So I think this whole work from home itself has been the greatest innovation, if you ask me. I mean, you know, because we are all been told long back that to work, you have to go somewhere, you have to get into a car, drive you know, two hours or one hour, depending on which part of the world you live in, and, you know, do something and then you come back home. And then we actually found out that you can actually now do this, uh, you know, uh, uh, but because you're forced to do it. So I think the level of, uh, you know, ability for people to innovate uh, even during the pandemic was, was tremendous. And that's what we have seen. We have seen our overall business grow almost like 30, 40 percent in the last uh, 15 months. Uh, we have innovated a huge amount. I mean, we have hired 2,000 people without seeing them in the last 18 months. I mean, I would have said that's absolutely not possible. And we have actually hired them now in places where we wouldn't have hired them from before because now we said we said that it doesn't matter where they are. I mean, you know, we have hired actually earlier we thought they should be in Bangalore or Hyderabad or Chennai or, you know, so-called tech places. Now we are hiring them from, you know, from Siliguri. We are taking people from Mexico and, you know, Philippines, Vietnam. And we said, like, it doesn't matter where these people are. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know. so I think uh, uh, the level of innovation, especially in the digital uh, uh, tech industry has been dramatic. Obviously, I mean, there are areas where one needs to come together and uh, especially when you bring in new people into a team and get them 
uh, uh, you know, understand what the background is and, you know, what needs to be done to get people up to speed in the beginning. I think one needs to come together and, you know, spend a lot of time. Obviously, there are, you know, areas where one needs to do whiteboarding and, you know, a, 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 a lot of ideation with deep kind of, uh, you know, uh, emotions and so on and so forth. I mean, finally, this platform is not the greatest one for for emotion i mean so so it's still a very bland platform to that extent uh, so so if you want to really get people excited uh, you know enthusiastic i think you still need to come together and work as, as one of the topics said i think we're all uh, human beings we're all uh, social animals and we like we like the personal uh, contact and that's why i'm here in new york i mean you know you know i've traveled all the way my first business trip in 20 months because i said that i need to come and be with the team here and then actually go and get in front of our clients and uh and, and i mean it's been a very you know very interesting and unique experience actually doing that i mean you know I, you know i mean i've been talking to all of them or zoom calls but getting into a room and doing the stuff uh, you know one said that obviously you know we need to do both it's not like uh, you know one one can only work remotely or one can only uh one have to do uh, uh, physically everything uh, so, if you take the innovation cluster, I mean, I mean, Bangalore was con- is considered, a, you know, some kind of a tech capital, uh, and I think it is booming. I mean, you know, I think some of the statistics says I think the last this year, I think there are 21 companies from India who have entered the Unicorn Club. Uh, that is double the number which have actually happened in the last 10 years. So, so I think uh, obviously there is a huge, uh, you know, I mean, amount of uh, innovation still uh, still going on, uh, uh, even. During this, a huge amount of funds have been raised. I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, billions of dollars of capital um, have been raised uh, uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, if you're in the right right sector, right business, so I don't think uh, people have invested in companies without even, you know, visiting or meeting the uh, founders kind of stuff. So I think, you know, uh, that has happened. So, so, so I guess finally we come down to what industry you are in. Uh, you know, obviously, like, you know, if you're in the, you know, medicine, manufacturing, where you, you really have to do work with physical stuff. There's no other option but to come together. But if you're purely in a, a digital kind of a uh, business, then I guess uh, um, uh, um, as the ancient, you know, and I totally share with my my level of productivity has gone up three times. Uh, I do more meetings in a day today than I used to do. I mean, you know, uh, I used to get on a plane, you know, two weeks a month. I mean, you know, I mean, and you know how getting onto a flight is, uh, you know, you waste a lot of time. So uh, I think, uh, you know, a whole lot of, you know, a lot more productive, a lot more effective, a lot more efficient. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, end of the day, I guess, uh, uh, I think different industries, different uh, sectors have different needs. Uh, and uh, one needs to understand that. Uh, and one side doesn't fit everything. Uh, so, but yeah, I think uh, um, uh, there is obviously... Uh, uh, scope to continue to innovate, uh, even while we uh, try to figure out how to deal with some of the issues. Uh, that would be my, uh, I guess, summary of the, my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, sharing, uh, Srika. You you have actually now highlighted that we can innovate even without going to the office, without a cluster, without a physical space. I think that's a great challenge and a great opportunity as well, but as, as you have said, there can be now virtual innovation uh, carried out online and so on. Based on that experience and what you have just said, do you see a need still for clusters to be around for us to achieve innovation? Or, or can we get innovation now without even clusters? I would make a very different statement. I mean, I think the concept of a cluster has changed, I think. I mean, if a cluster was 10 square kilometers, that's disappeared. I mean, you know, the cluster is 10,000 square kilometers. So, so, so I think, I think we need to think very differently now. And this is, I think this opened it up. I mean, saying that, you know, Silicon Valley is not a cluster. Bangalore is not a cluster. Uh, something else is not a cluster. While, while you have these micro clusters because people need to get together an idea, but what this has opened up is it's opened up, I would say, macro clusters or super clusters or whatever. So the opportunity, I mean, clusters obviously are needed. I mean, definition of a cluster is, you know, uh, how do you get a set of people, communities to work together to innovate? Uh, So I guess the concept of a cluster 
would be needed uh, but the old concept of a cluster that it has to be physical and proximity and you know everybody has to be you know uh, in each other's pockets uh, at least from my point of view uh, is no more relevant thank you i would like to just now pose a question to all our uh, panelists and speakers here what would you see as the key success factors to achieve innovation breakthroughs and and what are the challenges that you see uh with innovation going forward uh, next year or the year ahead maybe maxim would you like to perhaps try to do yes, this yes well, thank you i i will try to to start and be short on that i believe that uh what uh what was said before well uh i i do agree with that and the the notion of the clusters has changed certainly it's not like the geographical notion but it became actually the uh, i would say like like the area uh notion of the cluster well meaning that people can be sitting every anywhere but but still being united by the things that they do in innovations uh well uh i think that um as a matter of fact the major success factor is really to be uh directed by the customer values and these values they changed obviously well the pandemic changed some of the things you know like we see that on the tremendous growth of let's say delivery services because people stay home so they need this this delivery things and i think it will somehow continue because some of these things that were brought about or pushed by the pandemic uh they happen to be really very continue, uh, convenient and responding to the needs of the people so one of the key success factors is to be sensitive to this so to say like market needs and then customer values the other thing of course is uh to stay on the on uh the top of all of the trends and these trends well that are starting now and that will be going for the future because everything is changing too fast and we we live in the vuca world you know like within the world of volatility uncertainty complexity and ambiguity and so the ability to change very fast will be another this key success factor for any company but certainly for the innovative companies well first of all and finally finally which is very important and i had spent a lot of time on that and we in the study showing that the mentorship or the work of those who can advise the startups or who can really ask right questions to the startups this is the very important uh i would say success factor for the innovation to grow thank you thank you can you what yeah, are your thoughts actually might build on what maxim said and also um totally agree with shrikar about the fact that uh it it's not about the definition of clusters will need to change because we're no longer uh, bound by geographic um or technological barriers now so so we can literally collaborate with anyone in the world um and and in many cases um just as if not more efficiently and effectively i, I think the real opportunity for innovation going forward is to use the tools that we have um and really broaden the uh broaden the sources of innovation not by being really good in one area but by bringing very different expertises together that's where i think there's going to be step changes so for example in in the um uh medical pharmaceutical drug development area uh in case you don't know it typically takes about 1.2 billion US dollars to get a drug to be approved in the market out of 10,000 compounds now um there's a there's a whole new area um uh using in what they call in silico so you've got in vivo which is uh, testing it on animals you've got in vitro which is testing done in the in a in a test tube and now you can do testing on a computer in silico and using a who would have known ai could be uh used to um narrow down 10,000 compounds uh more effectively than by just a poor uh, a phd um student just trying to sort of uh, uh poke around and try all these different um uh, cell line assays so that's one area 
Another area where disparate expertise can come in is um, in digital health. And um, we have device now. Uh, doctors actually um, could only used to take your, um, your blood pressure, etc., whenever you visit them once a month. Now you've got watches that measure it multiple times every day. And that integration is going to be quite incredible in the potential it has. Uh, but it also requires quite big um, paradigm shifts in how we all think about innovation. It's not just about being better at one area. It's actually how do we learn from all the other um, incredibly um, uh, innovative um, um, uh, developments in other areas and integrate it into something that, that just creates a better mousetrap and outcome for the customer and the consumer. Thank you. What about your thoughts, Srika? Right. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I, I agree with what I think uh, Maxim and Tian sh- said about uh, one of the things Maxim talked about. I think uh, customer focus is extremely critical uh, uh, when you're doing, uh, you, uh, you've got to keep the customer in mind while you're, uh, you know, uh, while you're innovating. You can't just be in a lab somewhere and trying to do something without really understanding, you know, what problems are we solving and are there real customers or people out there or real problems out there which need to be solved. And and I think uh, Tian did speak about, uh, you know, uh, areas of opportunities to uh, uh, to, uh, to innovate. Yeah, so I think, I mean, uh, uh, it's a very, very broad topic and very deep topic in terms of how to do successful innovation. I mean, you know, obviously there are a lot of things about, uh, you know, uh, 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 getting the right, getting the right people, continuing to ideate, test, test, test the success uh, of your ideas uh, that they, they, they are, that that they actually work, and then there, of course there are these macro innovations which are one is trying to solve deep problems like find the next cancer drug or send a rocket to Venus or Mars or wherever it is. Uh, two, there are micro innovations which are possible to improving uh, business processes and uh, improving, you know, customer uh, centric uh, business delivery and, and and so on and so forth. So I think a whole lot of areas one, uh, you know, can innovate upon. Uh, you know, uh, one need not think that innovation is always the big bold stuff, but uh, there, there is scope to uh, uh, doing very mature enterprises and not just a startup idea, but uh, there's a lot of scope for la- mature, large enterprises to also innovate. And actually, there's a lot more need for them to innovate, uh, uh, for them to be nimble, agile, and and uh, more competitive uh, as as they as they go forward. And that itself can be a very interesting topic about how large, uh, large, large organizations which are really stuck in their ways of doing things and. Uh, and understanding their business models and business process can innovate. Actually, I think it's easier for you know new ideas, new startups, new people to get together because the purpose is just that to do something new kind of stuff. So it's, I think you know there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, uh, end of the day, I guess it's all about uh, mindsets. Thank you very much. We, we've heard from our three speakers their thoughts on key success factors in promoting innovation. If I can just quickly sum up what you have said. Number one, mentorship. And number two, bringing different skill sets together, different expertise together. Three, being customer-centric. And number four, being able to test ideas to make it, uh, being able to be integrated and to be implemented. And I think these are key lessons that we can learn from our four uh, distinguished speakers here. We have about five minutes left before we end this session. And I'd like to just ask another question to the panel here. You are all great experts on innovation, but this has been very much uh, focused on technology innovation. How do you bring your expertise in technology and innovation to solve the problems of the world? Social innovation. I, I think we need to look at how we can implement social innovation to solve some of the problems that societies and their communities are facing right now. Uh, the need for sustainable development, for inclusive development, all of that would need some form of social innovation. How, how can we implement social innovation using the expertise that you have right now? 
Perhaps can I can I do the reverse order, starting with Rikha first? Right, you put me in a spot, uh, Michael. I mean, unfortunately, I claim no no thing in terms of. Uh, I mean, I guess uh, uh, I think what we we need to change our politics. I think so uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, uh, we are all as you said, we are technologists. Uh, we are uh, uh, you know trying to understand how. Uh, you know, things can come to bear to work for common good. Uh, but I think when you when you try to bring in these, where larger societies uh, are brought into play, I think uh, it's the participation of of, of, of the people uh, in such initiatives and the people who are responsible for ensuring the participation of people like. Uh, you know, Tian mentioned about, you know, medical care, right? I mean, you can innovate today to deliver medical care in, in poor countries uh, through wider use of technology, telemedicine, a lo whole lot of other stuff. Uh, but how do you then, who will put in the infrastructure, who will invest in the social capital to actually, you know, put all this in place? Uh, because end of the day, technologists can, you know, innovate, come up with the ideas, uh, but really to drive these ideas forward, make them effective, I think requires a wider, uh, I guess, participation, audience, and a lot of uh, political will, I would say. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Chishika highlighted something which is uh, is quite unfortunate. Um, you know, you, you take a, a decade or two before the entire world was talking about, let's get together, globalization, let's come together, let's, let's meet common ground. And uh, unfortunately, it seems like we're going the other way these days. And um, I, I think that's a big constraint on, on, on social and, and technological innovation. Um, for, for example, when, when you know, we're, we're trying to develop a, uh, a, a treatment for cancer, um, we work with incredible scientists, but in different areas. So if you've talked to a biologist, if you've talked to a, a, a chemist, if you talk to you know, someone from another discipline, a pharmaceutical guy, they all have very good expertise. They know what they're talking about in their area, but you can't get to a good outcome unless everyone comes onto a common ground with a common goal. And um, hopefully uh, as a world, uh, uh, we, we start listening to the other side a little bit more. I think that's, uh, that, that'll be a good start. Thank you. Maxim? Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I work for the government of Moscow as well, you know, like leading the uh, Human Capital Development Foundation, but uh, under the Department of Entrepreneurship and Innovation of the City of Moscow. And what we do, we actually are dealing with this sort of social innovation, meaning that trying to be at this point very, very sensitive to what are the immediate needs let's say, of the young technological entrepreneurs in the city of Moscow. And we have so many considering that we have, well, the Moscow Innovation Cluster has, you know, like tremendous number of labs, institutions, pretty much everything. And what happened with the pandemic that, you know, like those people who were in, uh, let's say, face-to-face -face businesses, they started to lose a lot. So we had to be very innovative how to recombinate these measures that the government could make in order to help. So, uh, and, and certainly, well, what, what uh, we do is more, I would say, uh, under this capacity about this bridging, you know, like what uh, uh, the government and the resources of the city can do uh, in order to promote as well as to support innovations of everyone who is in the area. So for, for, for us, this is very, very natural. I think it will only strengthen as the time goes. Thank you very much. I think we've just about reached the time for our session to conclude. I think we had a good conversation and a good sharing from our three experts who have been with us here this morning. I'd like to thank Maxim Kiselev, Tienchio, Srika Reddy for your willingness to share your thoughts and your experiences with us. I think innovation is a journey. Innovation is not a destination. There's a long way forward for us to still 
promote innovation. And I think at the end of the day, we need to have visionary governments, visionary corporate leaderships, and, and good teamwork to move forward to scale up innovation. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Glad to be thank you. part of the Bye -bye. session. Take care. Bye -bye. Stay well. Stay safe. Take care.